Hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, there's still people coming in, but we're going to get started and accommodate them when they arrive. So um, I'm Jasmine Raymond, curator at DIAC. Welcome to Artists on Artists lecture series. Um, this program was established about um, 11 years ago, 2000, yeah, 2001, and it's a two-part invitation. First, um, we invite artists that we admire to consider sharing publicly some thoughts, observations, opinions on, our, on an artist in our collection, in DS collection or in our sites, permanent sites or our programs. The second part of the invitation is also to allow us, you, us, um, through this public revelation, this declaration, um, to indirectly reveal themselves to you and to me and to other people as to their process, as to the thinking that goes on in the practice that we don't get to see in the studio, or some of us get to see, but not all of us. So this is a, it's the motivation of the artist on artist, right? And um, we've been so glad to have such a loyal audience. So I'm very grateful to see all of you here. And many of you are repeated visitors to the program. And we are also grateful to our sponsors. So um, we have to give a thanks to the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and also to Brooklyn Brewery for the complimentary beverage tonight. And I have to thank personally to my colleagues uh, at DIA, John, Patrick, Max, Rebecca, Christy, Megan, Melissa, Jennifer, Sarah, Laura, Carrie, and Kelly. Because behind the scenes, they put this together. Um, and there's a lot that happens that you don't get to see. Um, and I'm eternally grateful to them. But above all, um, my gratitude goes to Alejandro, who I met recently about maybe a year and a half ago. I think in Venice, which was not such a bad site, <laughs> um, at his pavilion for Uruguay. And I was enamored by the work and I found a lot of um, mutual grounds that we share um, an enormous passion for literature, for books, for authors, but also um, for this illness that Enrique Vilamatas, the Spanish writer, recently had called the Mal de Montalvo which is uh, an illness for literature, right? <laughs> Literary illness. And, but a lot of the work that, I, that I've seen recently of Alejandro, he has a beautiful show up, uh, Muragai, and an um, amazing show I heard at Mumok in Vienna, which I have the catalog, but I haven't been able to see. Um, it's that the work is not only about language as written language, but also the language uh, that we absorb through silence and through presence of people and, and, and uh, these other multiple levels of language that is not only the written, the word, but there's these m m multiple plateaus of language. And that I find extremely inspiring and um, really moving. And as a viewer of his work and a fan, I think that um, the fact that he shows on Kawara um, was thrilling. Um, we were all cheering in the office and um, looking forward to tonight's talk, as, as you, many of you are also lovers of Onkawara's work. This is quite a, a nice match. Thank you, Alejandro. Uh, <clears throat> well, good evening, everyone, and thanks very much for being here. And thank you very much, Yasmil, for the very generous introduction and for this opportunity. I appreciate the invitation. Um, and I'll, I'll just start. I'm going to read a text I wrote for tonight. To begin, and before directly addressing Onkawara's work, I'd like to read a paragraph by Tom Burr I recently found online that I think clearly situates both the intentions of the series, artists on artists, as well as some of my own working methodologies, which to a very large extent are an understanding of art as a form of art history. By reading this, I'll try to justify why artists commenting on other artists' work is not entirely dissimilar to the work that artists commonly do in their studios. Artists look at other artists, 
We hear ourselves across time and on the other sides of walls, working, not working, listening, painting, speaking, not speaking. We watch what we make and how we make it. We search for clues, for substance, for stimulation and connection. When we work out and through each other, we tangle our language together and produce new sentences, distinct syntax. Our tendencies and our preferences, our ideas and various ways of placing those ideas, our styles even, seem to need the company of each other. There is a politics to placement and alignment and company. And there is a genealogy created out of manifestos, practices and love poems, out of close encounters in our immediate surroundings and out of trans-historical crushes. Tonight's talk will hinge on what Burr refers to as the entangling of languages, a poetic way of referring to the concrete consequences that result from an often imaginary dialogue between artists. My reading of Onkawar's work is tinted perhaps by narcissistic projections of my own work onto his own. As it has been fam famously argued, criticism, if this should be that, is a contemporary form of autobiography. Criticism says equally as much of the critic as that which is being analyzed. The second theme on which the talk will focus is, not surprisingly, the question of time. Time, said Austerlitz in the observation room in Greenwich, was by far the most artificial of all our inventions, and in being bound to the planet turning on its axis was no less arbitrary, arbitrary than would be, say, a calculation based on the growth of trees or the duration required for a piece of limestone to disintegrate, quite apart from the fact that the solar day, which we take as our guideline, does not provide any precise measurement, so that in order to reckon time, we have to devise an imaginary average sun, which has an invariable speed of movement and does not incline towards the equator in its orbit. If Newton thought, said Austerlitz, pointing through the window then the curve of the water around the Isle of Dogs, glistening in the last of the daylight. If Newton really thought that time was a river like the Thames, then where is its source and into what sea does it finally flow? Every river, as we know, must have banks on both sides. So where, seen in those terms, where are the banks of time? What would be this river's qualities? Qualities per perhaps corresponding to those of water, which is fluid, rather heavy and translucent. In what way do objects immersed in time differ from those left untouched by it? Why do we show the hours of light and darkness in the same cycle? Why does time stand still and motionless in one place and rush headlong by another? Could we not claim, said Austerlitz, that time has itself been non-concurrent over the centuries and the millennia? It is not so long ago, after all, that it began spreading out over everything. And is not human life in many parts of the earth governed to this day less by time than by weather, and thus by an unquantifiable dimension which disregards linear regularity, does not progress constantly forward, but moves in eddies, is marked by episodes of congestion and eruption, recurs in ever-changing form, evolves in no one knows what direction. This, of course, is by the late, uh, too often quoted, W.G. Seabelt. As a way of furthering and tangling the concepts of time and artistic influence, let's look at this photograph by Louis Lawler titled Still Life Candle from 2003. The picture depicts the remains of what seemed to have been a dinner amongst friends. Certain details included in the composition locate the scene in a particular social, cultural, and economic class. The crumpled cloth napkin, the imported cigarettes, the empty wine glasses, so empty and clean that they seem to have not been used, or are they meant to call attention to the possibly staged nature of the photograph? Both the Onkawara painting and the contents of the table speak of the inevitable passage of time as well as the possible fabrication of time. A lingering silence, a stillness in the air after what we imagine might have been a lively conversation. In some cases, strategies of appropriation, 
perhaps in the case of Louis Lawler, could be thought to be contemporary continuation of the traditional tradition of collage. And collage, in turn, shares ma many characteristics with the still live genre, specifically their shared involvement with quotation, parody, and cultural inventory. The candle, so perfectly aligned with the window frame in Lawler's photograph, recalls one of Gerhard Richter's photorealistic painting of candles. One of these paintings would be featured on the cover of Sonic Youth's 1988 album, Daydream Nation. The distance that takes us from Sonic Youth to Richter is perhaps equivalent to the critical and oftentimes historical distance from which Lawler observes and photographs her subject matter. In any case, and to get back on topic, the candle begins to appear in still lives primarily in the Renaissance as memento mori, a reminder of our mortality, a sign that seems to be poetically saying, life passes away like smoke. An extinguished candle, usually accompanied by a pipe and books and food and musical instrument, added to the vanity of our brief life. The 19th century would transmute these signs into one of, ones of peace, coziness, and domesticity, until in Picasso and Braque, they are emblems of shrinking privacy, the vestiges of harmony in a world beginning to finally shatter. Lawler's photograph seems to be recuperating the function of the historical still life, one conceived as a domestic art, one capable of situating, sorry, one capable of situating the scene's place in a society while attempting to refine the art of living to a higher degree. It also becomes, once again, a reminder of our mortality, a symbol of what shall be taken from us. The candle is blown out, the party is over. The candle, as an analogy of the photograph, is preserved for future enjoyment. The extinguished candle, like Lawler's photograph and like Onkawara's date painting, are traces of that which has been. But how does photography work in relation to the Onkawara painting as a marker of time? And how does the painting work as a marker of good taste, as a marker of a life well lived? Onkawara's body of work may be loosely categorized under two large subgroups. On the one hand, particular works, that is, works that describe his daily activities. I am still alive, I got up. I went, I read, I met. And on the other hand, general works, works that in spite of the author's idiosyncrasies more easily include or reference our shared existence. The Today series and One Million Years, for example. In Dia's collection, there are 36 paintings from the Today series, all currently exhibited at Dia Beacon. There is one painting for every year from 1966 when the series was initiated until 2000 which coincides with the opening of the museum. Ankawara began the series on Tuesday, January 4th, 1966. I'm curious about what happened earlier that week or over the weekend that triggered the painting. What happened Monday in anticipation? What happened the rest of the week? Although these playful questions will remain unanswered as answering them would in fact provide not much more than anecdotal clues, what one should perhaps point out or be reminded of as relevant in terms of biography is that Onkawara is of the generation that came of age immediately after World War II. He is a direct witness to the consequences of war. And even though the figurative work Kawara made before the more conceptual work for which he is best known is a more overt indication of this, a Beckett-like search for hope amid despair and a sense of continuing to live with an acknowledged defeat can also be recognized in Kawara's current practice. I'll come back to this a bit later. Each of the date paintings that constitute the ongoing Today series is a monochrome field on which is inscribed the date of the day that the individual painting is executed. This is done in the language and according to calendar conventions of the country in which Kawara is present at that particular moment. If the work is not completed by midnight, he destroys it. Some days he makes more than one painting, most days he makes none. The paintings are discrete objects, not in terms of their individuality, as each one is codependent and functions as part of a series, but in terms of their relative modesty. 
The works conform to one of eight sizes, ranging from 8 by 10 to 61 by 89 inches, as standardized early in the course of the project. Most of Diaz's holdings conform to the 10 by 13 inch size. Given the orientation of the canvas, the paintings, unlike Lawler's still life, are not a portrait of days, but a landscape. Each painting is painstakingly executed by hand. Kawara mixes the, mixes the colors afresh so that the hue of each one is unique. Colors and tonalities in the brown, gray, and blue-black areas of the spectrum are most prevalent. The colors are reminiscent of shadows, of dimmed light. They are the colors of the ocean when it is about to rain, or they are the color of the day passing. The archive of hues creates a syntax that marks time. Here is a comparative view of swatches from each one of the paintings displayed at Dia. Abstracted in these ways, the colors are reminiscent of fabric, of suits men could wear at an office or a bank. They are the colors of conformity, uniformity, of ultimately a sublimated sense of self. But, and again to get back on track, in relation to the series, degradation of hues implies that one does not clearly perceive or is not fully aware of the instant that marks the shift from day to day, from present to past, from one painting to the next. The gradation of hues in Kawara's paintings form a subtle syncopation that signal the difference in the present sameness. The paintings could be regarded as memorials for the time it took to make them. There are also reminders that time is secession that, in the words of Tennyson, time is flowing in the middle of the night, that is, flowing within these darkened nighttime hues and in between each one of these concrete markers. Four or five coats of acrylic paint are evenly applied to the surface of the canvas, as well as on the sides, creating one whole three-dimensional three entity. Each layer is sanded before the next is added, creating a dense matte surface. The white letters, numerals, and punctuations are meticulously built up along the center of the canvas across the monochrome field. Kawara skillfully renders the script, initially an elongated version of Gilsan, later the quintessential modern Futura. I am certain Kawara appreciates the pun of selecting a font whose name and style points towards the future. Kawara generally signs the painting on the center of the reverse side of the canvas, which is the other side of the date. Each painting is set to take an average of eight hours to be completed, that is, a full working day. When not on view, each painting is housed in a handmade cardboard box, dated on its side and front, that oftentimes contains a clipping from a local newspaper from the city in which the artist was resident on that date. The boxes and paintings are very rarely displayed together. I wonder if the excessive care taken in creating this kind of packaging means that they were ultimately meant to be stored. The boxes are little coffins of time. Museumification and mummification become one and the same archival impulse. There are a number of direct binary opposite correlations at play here, between the dark hue of the canvas and the once white hue of the newspaper, the white paint in which the date is rendered and the blank ink, sorry, and the black ink that delivers the news, the modern font of the date and the usually serif font of the newspaper, the monochrome field and the photojournalistic images usually included in the clippings. The paintings and its container are two sides of the same day two different ways of experiencing and retelling the same moment. It would seem that the repetitive and ritualized act of painting for Ankawara is a meditative process concerned with the loss of ego, a pre-language state of being, a form of alienation. Habit, like prejudice, creates an illusion of predictability as it keeps things the same by turning a blind eye to difference. Sigmund Freud's word for habits was symptoms. 
Symptoms were, by definition, by the fact of their repetition, holding operations, ways of living in the present by holding on to the past. Kawara's repetitive practice becomes a form of ritual, a staging of a metaphysical crisis. This crisis refers to the historical context I previously alluded to, both the existential crisis that occurs after the war and its reflections in the, in the development and history of art. As a member of the last of the avant-garde, the last neo-avant-garde, Kawara is both a sign that delineates the frontier or border reached by this group and also someone who is continually confronted by it. The avant-garde marks a limit against which to contend with, but also against which to bounce off. This bouncing off creates a spiraling effect, a body of works that create difference through repetition. In this way, the directionality of progress appears to be no longer linear but spiraling, where things reappear but at a different place, at a different value. Up until December 28, 1972, most date paintings were subtitled. The subtitles for the works were derived from either a headline or a caption found on the accompanying newspaper clipping. The last date painting to include a subtitle other than the day of its making happens to be in Dia's collection. The subtitle for this painting made in Sweden on December 28, 1972 is I don't know. It is as if a realization had been reached at that point and all further insight postponed until this had been thought through or overcome. The phrase is very similar to the one attributed to Socrates, I only know that I know nothing, by which he meant not that he does not know anything, but instead that one cannot know anything without absolute certainty. After December 28, 1972, all paintings are subtitled with the day of the week in which the painting is made. It would seem that Kawara at least is certain of that much. But it also makes the series more self-referential in the sense that each painting is now more directly referencing other date paintings and less daily news or events. Other subtitles in Dia's collection include two tankers and tug Sorry, two tankers and two tugboats crashed in a fiery disaster in Lower New York Bay. Da Vinci's manuscripts, which were produced between 1491 and 1505. La violencia y el odio racial envuelven a los Estados Unidos. Ascent stage and command ship dock. Commanders Charles Conrad Jr. and Alan L. Bean call through the tunnel to rejoin Commander Richard F. Gordon Jr the withdrawal of all United States ground troops from Cambodia is to be completed ahead of the June 30 deadline under, president, uh, under present plans of the Nixon administration, senior government officials said today in Washington. Dia's collection includes particularly grim, war-related references, but other paintings include more poetic or philosophical subtitles such as New York's traffic strike, I thought about memory and sense. This painting is January 15, 1966. Janine came to my studio. I am painting this painting from 123 Chambers Street to 405 East 13th Street. I have decided to be alone. I am dating here. Snow in New York City. USA began to bomb North Vietnam. So in fact, between the regularity and standardization imposed by calendar and linguistic conventions, there are slippages of subjectivity, both in terms of the subtle traces of manual execution and the arbitrary decisions made regarding canvas size and color, but mostly through the oftentimes diaristic tone of some of the early subtitles. The, install the installation at DIA contains a further hidden ritualistic component the air in the room is ionized. Its air is purified as a result of a layer of charcoal placed beneath the floorboards of the gallery at the explicit request of the artist and following ancient Japanese traditions. Finally, the title of the series, the Today series, seems to refer not to the concrete paintings, but to the moment of their exhibition. That is, the today of our encounter with them or the present of their presentation. 
This already very explicitly sets a relation of at least two points in time, the making of the work and the exhibiting of the work. My first choice when invited to participate in the series was Robert Ryman, as he is the artist from the collection that is perhaps most foreign to me, the one I feel that in spite of my admiration for the work, I have intuitively less to say about. In fact, I started to sketch out a possible beginning and thought of altering and possibly misappropriating Harold Rosenberg's famous sentence, but actually couldn't get much past it. Quote, the American painter Robert Ryman took to the white expanse of the canvas as Melville's Ishmael took to the sea, end quote. I bring this up because ultimately Onkawara and Robert Ryman are not unrelated. What directly relates them is their relationship to the monochrome in regards to the history of painting. There is also amongst them a relationship to Melville, as I think Onkawara in some ways exemplifies the moral of the story of Bartleby, Bartleby, in the sense that each day painting could be thought of as a marker of a present moment that the painter feels obliged to let pass without making an image of it. Kawara is presented with the opportunity of painting today beyond tautologies, but he, as Bartleby, prefers not to. He prefers to simply date the refusal. In an earlier version of this talk given by Jeff Wall on December 16, 1993, he smartly contextualizes Onkawara's practice at the intersection of the monochrome and history painting. Two styles of painting that have, for one its origins and for the others its demise, intricately associated with the advent of photography. The monochrome, more than any other single type of painting, marks a threshold. The monochrome could be argued to be the conclusive form of painting within the logic of reductivism and the overwhelming progression towards the predominance of photography in documenting the real. The monochrome is the moment the figure-ground relationship is suppressed or transcended. It is the moment of break with the whole tradition of figuration and illusionism. The monochrome is a surface on which painting reflects on its own possibilities as a medium. The act of putting something on top of a monochrome is, we could say, the act of resuming the development of the traditional structure of modern painting. In Kawara's case, it is Jeff Wall's idea that the genre that is being furthered by this act is history painting. That is, paintings that represent a historical event, usually associated with dynastic or national formation. This kind of painting was obviously thrown into crisis by the emergence of photography, specifically photojournalism. In contrast to the monochrome, where by definition, no event can make an appearance, that is, no event but its own making, photojournalism, on the other hand, aims at nothing but making events visible as pictures. So to some extent, the date paintings display a layered progression in art history from the representational date to the monochrome field to photojournalism as included via the newspapers in the paintings containers. In a, posthumous, in a posthumously published essay, Virginia Woolf sketched a scene she called the moment, summer's night. She began with five sentences that described the environment around her, from murmuring trees to an airplane hum Having filled in those details that combine rustic pastoral vision with the foreboding echoes of modernity, Wolf stopped to ponder. Yet what composed the present moment? If you are young, the future lies upon the present like a piece of glass, making it tremble and quiver. If you are old, the past lies upon the present like a thick glass, making it waver, distorting it. All the same. Everybody believes that the present is something, seeks out the different elements in this situation in order to compose the truth of it, the whole of it. Wolf's articulation of her tactile sense of the moment provides apt introduction of how the moment's characteristics were conceived then. 
To begin with, Wolf noted, the present moment is largely composed of visual and sense impressions. Something very similar to what Walter Benjamin would write at around the same time period, the possibility of a now can arise only in its tangible recognizability. To describe how the moment is defined visually and sensually, Wolf deployed the concept of impression. Yet Wolf's nostalgically retrospective tone throughout the essay embodies the realization that the moment, by nature fleeting, can be reconstructed only after the fact. She thus sketches a central philosophical problem of modernity. If our sensation and perception tell us that a moment of presence is possible because we can feel it, how can this possibility be reconciled with the impossibility of stopping or doubling back time? The possibility of a moment opens a hole in time, a gap between sensation of the moment, which can occur in the moment, and the rational effort to recognize, classify, or respond to that sensation, which can arise only after the moment and while other moments are still occurring behind it. The seemingly simple single moment is conceived as inconceivable, both because the moment is always already gone before we can perceive it, and because the single moment is therefore extended beyond one moment. The inability to occupy a present moment characterized the alienation of modern experience. The modern subject was inexorably split between the body's sensation, which occurred in one moment, and the consciousness of those sensations, which could not be present in that same moment. He or she was primor primordially alienated from the responses and impressions of his or, or her own body. This does not mean that no present presence can occur. It simply means that we can only feel it. The present, or the pure now, is the moment of emotional understanding, the moment before a decision is made. In a moment, the body receives sensations non-rationally, or more exactly, pre-rationally, and by the time cognition catches up to sensation, the moment is gone. Perhaps this is what the today paintings and their ritualized meditative process are ultimately a metaphor for. The modern conception of presence focused on the nation that, sorry, the modern conception of presence focused on the notion that presence must in fact be composed of several moments. This division of the present moment into stages was pioneered by, was pioneered by Edmund Husserl who straightforwardly called presence a fantasy. Husserl rejected the concept of presence in favor of what he called presentification. Presence, the neologism indicates, can be conceived only as a fabrication, a fiction. The possibility of presence can happen in two registers, a pure present of raw sensation that occurs before and in the absence of the mind's endeavor to categorize it as something, and then the running off process in which efforts to account for that presence moves further and further away from the initial generative moment. In this running off, the construction of something we call present becomes a function of increasingly distant memory. The fabrication of present moves further into the future as the moment of presence moves further into the past. The Today series is a way of running parallel to time. It is a marking of time as it itself unfolds. It is a way of objectifying time, a marker of the temporal evidence of reality. If time passes, Kawara seems to be saying, it is necessary that there should be something that remains static, at least materially. The Today series stages a paradox of a long, seemingly interminable now, the, pres the present repeated as future. The temporality of everyday life is marked by an irony which is its own creation. This temporality is held to be ongoing and non-reversible and at the same time characterized by repetition and predictability. In the Today series and in spite of its efforts to articulate difference through counting, every day, even tomorrow, even yesterday, is today. 
But of course, the seemingly interminable now of, that, of the series can't be literally endless. Closure of the series comes with Kawara's death. However, and for now, the I Am Still Alive series of telegrams sent by On Kawara started with the following three messages. I am not going to commit suicide, don't worry. I am not going to commit suicide, worry. I'm going to sleep, forget it. From then on, Kawar has intermittent, intermittently sent out telegrams that read, I am still alive. This material reduction onto which his subjectivity is folded suggests physical and temporal apartness, which in turn puts into question the reliability and accuracy of the message. Because of this, and given the statements that initiated the series, I am still alive is also and primarily about its opposite and complement. I am not still alive. This, in actuality, is the common usage of the telegram, the communication of extraordinary events such as death, birth, war, and peace. I am still alive, in fact, suggests the unavoidable imminence of death. They are out of the blue reminders of our own and his own mortality. Perhaps they are reminders that fall not out of the blue sky, but out of the dark blue canvas of a date painting. That is, they are reminders meant to take us out of our numbed present. As Russian literary critic Viktor Shklov Shklovsky wrote in his 1917 manifesto, Art as Technique, Habitualization devours works, clothes, furniture, one's wife, and the fear of war. And art exists so that one may recover the sensation of life. It exists to make one feel things, to make the stone stony. The purpose of art is to impart the sensation of things as they are perceived and not as they are known. What Ankawara learns in his present while making the work is withheld and very different from what we feel and later know about today, which is his future. In a very simple way, perhaps that is the most obvious and profound teaching of the work, to stop looking or living the present as if it were the past and thus to experience the present, the continuous present differently. If our lives consist of a series of moments that pass away before we can recognize and acknowledge them, the moment of shock, or more simply, a defamiliarized moment, amongst them the encounter with art, serves to return to our sensation and perception, and afterwards to our consciousness, the immediacy of the present moment, even as it is, inexorably slips away. As we know, the problematic of time is its fleeting nature. Time passes, or in other words, time takes its time unraveling. The present, in some ways, is our feeling of the passage of time. And as we have seen, perception, or what Virginia Woolf, among others, calls impression, would be the face of consciousness that constitutes the pure now and memory every other face of the continuity or said in very layman terms, the purpose of time is to prevent everything from happening at once. Time is either all present or no present. Time is either composed only of interlocking presents or, or it is constantly decomposed into elongated pasts and futures. There is either one present moment after another after another or no present moment at all only past barreling through what we call present into what we call future. In this sense, we could argue that within the flow of time, the, presence, the present is theoretically non-existent, as the present is, by definition, the opposite of passing. The present is therefore, and according to this logic, withdrawn from temporality. And this removal leaves in its place a sort of emptiness, a space and place of the present. The series of today paintings seem to occupy these gaps, 
They are a spacing of time. They are markers for the physical opening of time as such. In other words, the work creates a rupture within the continuity of time. And time, according, according to Borges, is nothing more and nothing less than the fragmentation of eternity. Each date painting can be thought of as a point that once set within the series of paintings forms first a line of time and then a number of lines that in turn form a plane of time, now without directionality. The paintings are thus points that punctuate time, that appoint time and space punctually. So, and to further drive this analogy fully into the ground, what is the actual point of these paintings? The paintings seem to present a man contemplating time slipping away, watching it unfold while documenting, accounting for its passage. The paintings occupy a fine line between a phobic obsession with time and an almost perverse fascination with its unfolding. Because of the gravity of that unfolding, because of the anxiety time might produce, there is a sense of defeat, of acknowledged defeat, a disillusion and incompetence palpable from the very outset of the series. There is not much one can do about the passage of time. One cannot stop it except through death. Time is ultimately a preoccupation with the ends of lives, in both senses, its purpose and the place of death. Our lives are driven, on the one hand, by the wish for satisfaction and are thus inevitably a chronicle of losses, and on the other hand, they are also driven, as Freud famously maintains, by the wish to die. Freud uses the term death instinct to speak of how people actively, if unwittingly, undo their lives and how this is a source of satisfaction to them, how this too is an object of their desire. However, Freud seems to be saying that people are not saboteurs of their own lives, acting against their own best interests. They are simply living towards death in their own fashion, and in this way, they're embodying themselves with a sense of agency. So within this context, by referring to how Freud speaks of the death instinct, I am referring to how, to some extent, he is talking about independence, about people's natural, unconscious, furtive independence. And I want to be clear that I'm not saying that Kawara's work is about the wish to die, but rather about his aspiration for independence. Freud, it seems, needed to believe that there was some point at which it was possible to stand beyond the reach of culture. And for him, the death instinct is an expression of this need to not submit oneself to life and culture. My point is that extracting oneself from the continuum of time by creating an object that dates this very act is perhaps tied to a similar impulse. In other words, the date paintings express for me a non-conforming to what is expected of us. And in this sense, they are both Bartleby and Beckett their withdrawal inwards and at the same time a form of resistance. To paraphrase Beckett, they are the inability to speak and the inability to be silent. The paintings are placeholders for the passage of time and in this way they function as souvenirs. They are reminders of the banality of our existence and they are a way of mourning our inability to have acted differently in the past and a provocation towards our possibilities of perhaps generating a change in the future. As souvenirs, the paintings are a logic extension of the snapshot or of the tourist's keepsake, that is, the preservation of an instant in time through a reduction of physical dimensions and a corresponding increase in significance supplied by means of a narrative. A narrative that, in our case, is primarily grounded by the place on Kawara occupies in art history. The souvenir, that is, the attempt to materialize time is a way of preventing memory to freely rewrite the past. 
In this question of memory, the question of retelling the past, is finally the place where Okawara's and my language become more apparently entangled. The place on which our fictive conversation centers is that instant I had previously mentioned, where the fabrication of presence moves further into the future as the moment of presence moves further into the past. In talking about memory, it is often described as both the object and the instrument of our desire. So memories, in this sense, remind us of what we want. Thank you. I'm open to questions if there should be any. Let's start with an easy one. Well, start off. I I hesitate to break up the the beauty of the meditation that you present. It was a really beautiful presentation, and I enjoyed it very much. I kept thinking about it as an art historian from another point of view. So my question breaks up. I think some of the magic of what you were presenting by thinking about Clement Greenberg and Michael Fried, who were writing concurrently with the first today paintings about the idea of presence and presentness as a work of art, which I've always seen as a kind of impossibility. And I'm wondering about your thoughts on this, and second of all, your thoughts about the today paintings in terms of the differential, the kind of incommensurability between the paintings themselves and what they seem to represent, and that seems to be a subtext of what you were presenting. That incommensurability I think of as a kind of sublime, like the Kantian sublime. So I'd like your thoughts on this. Um, it's hard to respond to that. Um, I think there's this might not be what you're asking, but I think there's a difference between repetition and um, a series that unfolds over time. And I think that's what he's doing. But I don't know if that's what you're asking concretely. Okay. I don't think one negates the other. Okay. To follow up on what you just said, Alejandro, would you say that he's starting over with every painting? Uh -huh. He's working on that first sentence of his novel over and over, and I. Yeah, I think there is some of that, but I, I think, um, and maybe that's the difference between repetition and reduplication. It's not like he's doing the same painting every day. Every day is obviously different, and there's a difference in that sameness. So, yeah, the project starts anew, but with the memory of the past in a way. So there is like a shadowing effect. Mm -hmm. In relationship to your own work, oh, do you, um, was, uh, you know, through the experience of your lecture, I was thinking, is this a self-portrait? Because it's, I've always seen actors in your work. And, uh -huh doing your reading, the, mm -hmm. what you compose, and um, tonight we got to see you. <laughs> so 
I'm just curious, uh, in relationship to your work, when you were preparing for tonight's lecture, um, were you thinking this was some sort of self-portrait? Um, not necessarily a self-portrait, but inevitably it's tinged by my interests and my readings and my understanding of things. And maybe this is um, a good way of answering the first question is, um, I didn't set out for myself like an academic um, expectation or like um, a level of um, I guess in a way, I, I was irresponsible in the sense that I just wrote what I th saw in the paintings and wasn't careful enough to place it within a previously written or historical discourse. Even though, of course, I set about a context for reading this work, but it was less um, rigorous in a way. I'm kind of half answering all the questions. Um, <laughs> It's hard to get away from this, like, um, self-fictionalizing, no? Like, this idea of the portraiture is, it's hard to escape it. Um, I was curious about the idea that the subject of his work is sort of imposed on him, right? Uh-huh. Maybe in relationship to your own, it doesn't feel as though the subjects of your work are the You are making a choice. Uh -huh. Well, it's not imposed in the sense that um, there is flexibility. It's not like he's punching in and doing a painting every day. There is like, um, he is his own boss in a way of this like very methodical um, Scrivener type thing. He doesn't have to paint and um, yeah, I, I don't see it as an imposition. I think it's it's more of a, um, it's kind of unavoidable to him, I think. I'm curious if you've ever, I mean, I, I, I definitely definitely see um, Laura as full of rage, mm -hmm. deep rage, and I feel that like their protest works. And They're also full of humor. Well, maybe in the book you saw the back of the box, I think they themselves are just yeah. funny. Yeah. Um, they'd be funny maybe if they were less. In a, in a Beckett they, type of humor. Places, yeah. Yeah. So in that, I see, I see them distinctly as language from a Japanese person, I mean, language is legible, and banishing the image in the most radical way, and banishing the possibility of literally his own life, except. Well, there is kind of aesthetically a, a resemblance to tombstones. No? It's like that's another thing you date. And when you see how they're installed and what his studio looks like, there is like this. No, but I just showed a photo of it. Um, they resemble cemetery plots. It's like this organization, this ar archiving of, of uh, possibility. Tim. <laughs> well done, and uh, the thing is, I'm having this flashback. I don't know if anyone remembers, there's this wonderful soap opera that started out like socks and like, like sand in the hourglass. These are the days of our lives. And what's hitting me is I would be fascinated to hear about your emotional relationship. Mm -hmm. um, 
I guess I would kind of agree with Rebecca. They're somewhat enraging. They're um, they're frustrating in a way. Like, uh, but they to me they're still they're clearly not non-celebratory, but there is hope in them in some ways. There is like a, this urging for change. Okay, thank you very much.